Hello, yes, it's me again, Georgia May Mossholder, back with Incomparable, and this one is kind of scary, The Wrath of Yahweh. Hmm. Yahweh is a jealous and avenging God. Yahweh is avenging and wrathful. Yahweh takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. Yahweh is slow to anger and great in power, and Yahweh will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. That's from Nahum 1 verses 2 and 3. If we could choose which attribute of God we would we could remove just like that, I think most of us would choose his wrath. No one likes it. The idea of Yahweh being avenging and wrathful and keeping wrath for his enemies strikes us as medieval, nasty, and cruel. And it is often a source of embarrassment in conversation with unbelievers. How very unmodern, how unpleasant to have a God who not only gets angry sometimes, but actually lists being wrathful as one of his characteristics. So, dismayed by the theology of mayhem, we hurriedly flick forward to a lovely letter like Romans only to find chapters 1, 3, and 9, or to find out what that nice man from Nazareth had to say about things. As long as you ignore the Sermon on the Mount, many of the parables and nearly everything he said in Jerusalem. To our horror, we discover that the wrath of God is everywhere. Clearly, Scripture is not as bothered by it as we are. Yahweh is wrathful. He is angry about sin and the terrible damage it has done to his creation. Every transgression of ours is an act of idolatry, putting something else, usually ourselves, before God, of adultery, responding to his commitment and love by rejecting him, and of sacrilege, living as if his holiness did not matter and falling desperately short of his standard. And all of these things rightly result in his wrath toward us. In our blindness, though, we often regard the wrath of Yahweh as not worthy of him. I think there are three main causes of this misunderstanding. The relationship between the old and new covenants is one of them. People with a superficial view of the Bible sometimes think that Yahweh was wrathful and jealous for his people in the Old Testament, but that with Jesus those things subsided, quite apart from the fact that Yahweh never changes, and the fact that the New Testament talks much more severely about many sins than the Old. This betrays a total failure to grasp why Jesus died. Jesus' death on the cross did not say, oh, it's all okay, because God is not angry with sin anymore. Huh. It said, God is incredibly angry with sin, so angry that this is the only way to save you. Jesus did not tell people the building was not on fire, but reminded him them that it was, and then proclaimed that he was the only emergency exit. That's why God's love, God's wrath, and Jesus' death are grouped together in the New Testament. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. That's a quote from Romans 5, verses 8 and 9. We were by nature children of wrath, 
like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. That's Ephesians 2, 3 and 5. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. That's Revelation 19, verses 13 to 15. The second misunderstanding is that God's wrath is somehow like ours, petty outburst driven by wounded pride or self-indulgence, divine toddler tantrums that result in pain and regret on all sides. If so, then the passage in Nahum we started with should put an end to it. Just after in announcing God's vengeful wrath three times over, the prophet reminds his listeners of something God revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. Yahweh is slow to anger. God does not have mood swings, flying off the handle at the end of a bad day. His wrath is always measured, always appropriate, and always righteous, and this makes all the difference. The third sort of con source of confusion is probably the biggest one. The idea that wrath and love are opposites. It is quite amazing how many people say things like, Oh, loving God wouldn't do that. Or, I believe God is love, not wrath. As if love and wrath were contradictory. But in response to genuine evil, the opposite of wrath is not love, but indifference. In John Grisham's novel, A Time to Kill, an Afro-Caribbean father discovers his little girl has been raped by two white men. And in his wrath, he shoots them. The story is powerful because, as readers, we know that vigilante justice is wrong and, and yet somehow feel that his wrath was the appropriate response to the crime. If we go around the Holocaust Museum and do not feel outraged that it happened, we are not loving, but apathetic. Similarly, a man who was not angry that his wife had been having an affair would not thereby demonstrate how much he loved her, but how little. So it is with God. We need to respond to these misunderstandings with truth. The wrath of Yahweh is real and righteous and scary. Flying off the handle is completely beneath the Most High God, but so is indifference to the horror of sin, and we need to adjust our thinking to cope with this. The fact is, whether we like the idea of God's wrath or not, we will all one day witness it for ourselves, as John saw. Quote, then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? That was Revelation six fifteen to 17. Who indeed? This one is the grace of God. But the free gift is not like the trespass, Romans 5.15. The whole Bible is about grace. The Old Testament at one level is simply an ongoing saga of man's sin in rejecting God 
followed by God's grace in accepting man. The New Testament is first the story and and then the application of the biggest grace moment in history. Whether you read about Abraham or David or Peter or Paul, you find scripture littered with people who didn't get what they did deserve, otherwise known as mercy, and did get what they didn't deserve, otherwise known as grace. Grace is everywhere. However, there's something about Paul's treatment of grace in Romans 5 that beats all the others. So we're going to do something unlike most of the rest of this book and study it in detail. Paul is arguing that just as we die in Adam, we die not because of our individual sins, but because we have our sin credited to us through someone else. So we come to life in Christ, getting eternal life, not because of our individual acts of righteousness, but because we have our righteousness credited to us through someone else. But Paul can't bring himself to leave it at that. He is so amazed at the grace of God, and particularly the shocking differences between dying in Adam and living in Christ, that he spends three verses describing them. The sentence we started with seems at first glance to be very obvious. Of course, the free gift, the grace of God shown in Christ, is not like the trespass. One is positive and the other negative. But if you look look at the next few verses, Paul is saying more than this. He is not just saying that man's Sin has negative results, and God's grace has positive results, as if the trespass was like losing one to zero, and the gift like winning one to zero. That would be so obvious. It would hardly be worth saying. He is saying that grace and its results are disproportionate to sin and its results. He is saying that the trespass is like losing one to zero and the gift like winning 100 to zero. The next few sentences give four reasons why. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. That's Chapter 5, verse 15. What does much more mean here? It cannot be talking about quantity because all men die for their sins. I don't think it can mean much more certainly either because both death in Adam and life in Christ are completely certain. I think what Paul is getting at is something like much more definitively, or much more lastingly. Well, think about it. Death in Adam is not the last word. It has been written over people's lives in pencil. It is visible in the lives of unbelievers, but it is always capable of being rubbed out and replaced, as it has been for all of us who have repented. The gift of grace in Christ, on the other hand, absolutely is the last word. It has been written in indelible ink, engraved on the hands of God for all who believe, incapable of removal or substitution or loss. Death in Adam can be overcome by God's grace. God's grace cannot be overcome by anything. Grace is God's great ace, untrumpable, far more significant, permanent, and definitive than the results of the trespass. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. 
chapter 5, verse 16. Now, Paul contrasts grace, the free gift, and judgment, the result of that one man's sin, in two ways. First, condemnation is an appropriate response to sin, but a free gift of justification is a thoroughly inappropriate response to it. It's common sense. Trespasses should lead to condemnation. And they definitely should not lead to justification. So grace is different from judgment in its appropriateness, if I can put it like that. Second, condemnation follows one trespass. But the justification followed many trespasses. Well, this makes the contrast even more shocking. If one sin leads to condemnation, surely many sins should lead to many condemnations. But they don't. Because the gift is of a different scale from the condemnation. And God's grace is of a different magnitude from his judgment. Instead, they lead to justification through the scandalous, outrageous grace of God. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. That's chapter 17. Here, the contrasts we have seen already all apply But if we look carefully, we can see that a further factor has been thrown in. The subject of the first main clause is death. Death reigned through the one man's sin. We would expect the subject of the second main clause to be life. Death reigned, but now life reigns. That's the contrast, surely? But when we look, we see the subject is not life, but us. The rulers are those who receive God's abundant provision of grace. We have not simply been transferred from one ruler to another, but transferred from being subjects under a ruler to rulers ourselves in the new realm of life. God's grace is definitively lasting totally inappropriate, unreasonable, enormous, and completely transforming. He not only takes away what we do deserve, the wrath of God, separation from him and death, but also gives us what we do not deserve, justification, union with Christ, and eternal life. Not to mention seating us with him in heavenly places in Christ. That's grace. Talk about amazing. Selah. Amazing Grace, written by the former slave trader John Newton in 1779, is the most popular hymn in the English language and has spent more weeks in the music charts than any other song except my way because everyone knows the tune there is no excuse for not singing it I would suggest finding a solitary place like a field or a hill and spending time singing aloud to God for his grace I can't sing but I will say it amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. 
The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will be, he will my shield and portion be, as long as life endures. Yea, when this flesh and heart shall fail, and mortal life shall cease, I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. If you like your songs about grace a little bit more upbeat, then the following are superb. He's going to list a few. Your Grace is Enough by Chris Tomlin and Matt Maher. Copyright spiritandsong.com, BMI 2003. Grace by Stuart Townend and Fred Human, copyright 2002, Thank You Music. I'm Alive by Br Simon Brading, copyright 2005, Thank You Music. Jesus, My Only Hope by Mark Altrog, copyright 2002, Sovereign Grace Praise, BMI. So, you can look those up. Mm. Yahweh is majestic. Oh, Yahweh our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? and the son of man that you care for him. That was Psalms 8, verses 1 to 4. If you want to understand God's majesty, all you need is a Bible and a night sky. The Bible will give you the words, majesty, awe, splendor, wonder, but looking at the stars will give these words something of their real meaning. Vocabulary often loses its power through exaggeration. As football players become awesome, skyscrapers, majestic, and so on. But the night sky gives a hint of what these words actually mean when they are used of God. The moon and the stars set in place by God loudly trumpet the utter majesty of Yahweh's name and the utter irrelevance of mine. Take a, a journey with me. If you're reading this reflection at a time and place where you can see some stars, get outdoors and take a torch so you can keep reading. If you're not, skip to the next reflection and come back to this one when it's a clear night. Then step outside and look up. By far, the closest thing you can see is the moon, if it happens to be in the sky where you are. True, a jumbo jet would still take two weeks to fly to it, but it's much dearer than anything else up there. The moon is pretty amazing because it doesn't produce any light of its own and just shines because of the reflected light of the sun. It's basically a big lump of rock. I sometimes wonder whether God put it there simply to show you and me what it means to shine every day in the reflected light of the sun. That's Second Corinthians 3, verse 18. Either way, the moon is a remarkable piece of work. Well, now find the brightest star you can see. That is Sirius, or the dog star. And it is about two and a half times the size of our sun light which takes 1.3 seconds to get from the moon to the earth takes eight years to get here from Sirius 
and this is one of the very closest stars to Earth. In galactic terms, it's the family two doors down on the other side of the street. You should be starting to get a sense of what the word majestic means. To get farther out into space, look for Orion's belt. That's the three stars that form an almost complete straight line. Under the right-hand end of the belt, there is a stunning purple shape that looks like a, a seahorse called the Horsehead Nebula, which only telescopes can see. Well, this is truly baffling to me because no one except God even knew it was there until 1888. If I had made something even a fraction as beautiful, I would have made sure everyone knew about it. This nebula is 1,600 light years away, so the light you can see tonight, traveling at 5.88 trillion miles per year, left it when the Roman Empire was coming to an end. To get from one side of it to the other at the speed of light would take three and a half years. Is not God high in the heavens? See the highest stars, how lofty they are. That's Job 22, verse 12. Now, if you've got a clear night, face southeast and use your peripheral vision, which is more sensitive to light, to find the Andromeda galaxy, an oblong, misty smudge in the sky. If you found it, you are now looking at the farthest object visible with the naked eye. It is an island of 300 billion stars, over 2.5 million light years away. Oh, that is unthinkable. If you're anything like me, these numbers become a bit unreal a while ago. Became a bit unreal a while ago. But hopefully they're making you realize something of how small you are. How majestic Yahweh is. And how ridiculous it is that he even knows who you are. David with none of these numbers, but with the same night sky in front of him, saw exactly what you see and wondered aloud why the God who made the heavens would have humankind in his attention. He understood the smallness of man. In Psalms 39, he described the lice of man as fleeting, a few handbreadths, nothing, a mere breath and a shadow. He also understood the majesty of Yahweh, having seen the moon and the stars that he set in place. And taking the two together, he could not understand why God would care for him. When I think of your heavens, the work of your fingers, what is man that you are mindful of him? It is important that we have this perspective. Louis Gid Giglio writes, We are fleeting mortals, frail flesh, little specks, phantoms. If this fact makes you a tad bit uncomfortable, you're not alone. Invariably, when I talk about the vastness of God in the cosmos, someone will say, Oh, you're making me feel bad about myself and making me feel really, really small as if that's the worst thing that could happen. But the point is not to make you feel small, rather to help you see and embrace the reality that you are small. You are. So am I. Any prolonged period of staring up into the heavens like you have just been doing will tell you that. More than that, though, it will tell you that you deserve a God of majesty not like that of a skyscraper or even a monarch, but the kind of star-casting, galaxy-forming, space-filling splendor that gives the word majesty back its real meaning. Oh, Yahweh our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. 
And I am going to close for that. That's about a half hour. Okay. I will be back with Yahweh is Mighty when I next come back. Good.